welcome back to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff and maker culture. I'm your host, Aaron, and joining me are... Joe and Josh. Yep, sadly, Christian had to go do some work stuff, so Josh, thank you for uh, filling in today. No problem. We've got some super exciting news lined up today. I'm very excited to get going with that on that, and I... I wouldn't be surprised that takes up most of the time tonight, so um, to get us all started, uh, what are you guys drinking tonight? I've got some Moon Man from the good old New Glarus, still working on through the sampler pack. I am also drinking Moon Man. And what? Yeah. And, well, to back it up, I have Staghorn here, just in case I run out of Moon Man. What's that? All right. Uh, it is their Oktoberfest. It is Ooh. rather delicious. Mm. It is that time of year. Yes, it, it is. is. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's my last one, so Joe, you can't have it. <laughs> I actually went to Costco today, and I finally got some more liquor. So I am now... Funny story, before I tell you how much of it I've had. Uh, I had oh, my good. wife open it today. I was, I was holding the baby earlier. I was like, oh, hey, can you get me uh, give me some of that scotch? It's like, she's like, oh, how much do you want? Like an inch? <laughs> and I'm like, yes. I would like an inch of that scotch, please. <laughs> so I'm probably a good three or four inches of scotch in already. So We're going to have to re-record this episode <laughs> again. <laughs> oh, no, I'm fine. This is going to be a great episode, though. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So, first order of business for news. Nibble, uh, which is an open source uh, kitty cat robotics platform, um, started their Indiegogo Indiegogo campaign. It is based on the OpenCat project, and it's a neat-looking laser-cut, like, wooden frame robotic cat. Uh, It's got, like, servos for the joints, and they have a custom-looking... circuit board um it is our arduino compatible but it's got like an accelerometer and gyroscope and all kinds of neat sensors on that one little board itself and uh i'm actually surprised at how cat looking it is but uh the uh project um creator is actually either chinese or japanese i can't remember but um his uh cultural um heritage is in like puzzle fit woodworking so this entire laser cut cat project, there are no screws or nails. It's all puzzle fit together, which I thought was super neat. So in in the video, they actually show like the head being assembled and pieces like slide into each other, and it's all like weird leverages and press fits, and it, looked, it was really cool. And uh, the board itself is only forty five bucks, but to get a full cat kit is like two hundred bucks. Yeah, and they're estimated to be delivering. Um, April of next year, so 2019. But it looks really cool. Yeah. And they actually, so it's got an ultrasonic sensor on the head, and they have it set up so that's the eyes. I love how the, the ultrasonic cat, sensors so, are always the eyes of the robot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because they are. But it, it looks so fitting in this one, though, because they're nice, big, round, black things on the cat's head. So. I say it kind of it it does mimic the uh, what was it like the the dancing robot thing that you could like they were like kicking over and something like that in those YouTube videos. I have no idea what it was called. What Boston Dynamics? Yeah, oh. yeah. That's Atlas. the robot abusers. Yeah, I doubt we're you're gonna get your back, Kevin. <laughs> yeah, they they're the ones that did the uh, the robot dog. Yeah, doing the uh, uptown yeah dance. That was yeah. the most horrifying video I've ever seen. <laughs> I think mine was when my my most feared one was when they showed a video of their of one just like running through the uh, park. Yeah, and all all I could imagine was like the freedom bots chasing <laughs> down terrorists, quote unquote terrorists, just you know never tiring. Yep. <laughs> Not until their power Off cells. Topic drop <laughs> anyway anyway yeah it's called nibble um with a y um for those of you who know what a nibble is it's half a bite 
How, Joe, do you know how many bits are in a byte? Eight. You know how many bytes are in a nibble? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Four. Four bits. <laughs> it's actually it's actually a thing. All right. Anyways, I just thought it was funny that they actually named it Nibble with a Y, like the computer science Nibble. Anyways, the next bit, um, there was a huge, I think it's huge, a very large um, repeal of some right to repair uh, laws in California. And I believe that was nationwide. Yeah. But, yeah. So you. Yeah, so some right to repair uh, activists were able to. It sounds like went through like a grueling legislative process where they had to explain to a panel of bureaucrats uh, why, you know, people like us should have the right to repair their own devices. Um, a lot of this came out of you know Apple was you know making it harder and harder to repair iPhones. You may have heard about John Deere locking down tractors, and so farmers can't even fix their own tractors without getting a licensed John Deere person to fix it. Um, yeah. This opened up a lot of that. Yeah, this is huge. The DMCA, Digital yes. Millennium Copyright Act. Yeah, there are some w- weird oddities, though, too, there, that it doesn't totally repeal everything. Right. I just can't believe one of the arguments Deer had was we don't want people pirating Taylor Swift from their tractor cabin. Like, in what reality is that an actual worry? I mean, honestly. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, so some of the, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. It's one of those things where, oh, well, you could do this because our stuff is so neat. So we should probably make sure no one can legally do that. And lock it down, but well, in terms of John Deere and what they did, I mean, they did it for the sole purpose of you having to spend money at their dealerships. Which, I mean, I get that they're taking care of their dealerships if they are personally owned, but I, I'm sorry, but no, like, just... yeah, that's it's ludicrous, absolutely yeah. ludicrous. Yeah, if I if I, if I own a you know. Those things are effing expensive. Yep. If I owned one, I would. I certainly, personally, I'd like to take care of the machines that I own. I would love to be to if if I if I had something like that, I would know enough to fix it, and I would love to do that myself, so I know exactly how it's taken care of. Because how often have you heard of actual car dealerships just screwing up routine maintenance or any other repairs? But they're like supposed to be the people to go to, to right? Yeah, get things fixed. I've had a truck that had issues that were caused by routine maintenance of the truck (laughs) yeah but i mean it was crazy though especially with john deere i mean honestly if you gave john deere the ability to literally microchip every piece in that vehicle it would it would have i mean they some of the things that we're doing i mean just basic routine stuff you had to literally and it wasn't even like you couldn't even like you would replace a piece on the tractor and it should work and it just the vehicle wouldn't start up because you didn't register it in their software. Oh wow. Was, yeah, it was wow. I mean it went really really far. Um and I mean when you talk about especially farmers, I mean a lot of those guys are D, I mean they are DIY most oh, of yeah. them are. Oh, yeah. Hardcore. They're like the most traditional maker oh, yeah. in, yeah. U- in United States culture. Yep. One of the more exciting so, things uh, I think that one brought out, though, was like the ability to um, unlock new phones from the very beginning. So now yes. cell phone dealers can unlock phones for you, um, which was totally illegal before. Interesting. They still make it hard, yeah. though. Let's just, I'm not going to lie there. Well, oh, yeah. no, but now it's legal. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. But companies like, what was it? Apple? Apple's still pulling all kinds of crazy stuff with theirs. I mean, I what was it? So, my trip to Belgium and Europe um here a handful of months ago and i got my phone stolen and thankfully i had well thankfully but unthankfully i had a iphone 
sitting in my bag and I go to <laughs> use it and thinking, oh, I'll just use a foreign SIM. It's a, you know, it's a prepaid company like cell phone and I had it for over six months. I call up the company literally from Belgium and I'm like, hey, I'm just trying to get this thing unlocked. They go, you with Apple, like ultimately force them to make it so that you have to literally be active on their network on this prepaid company's network for Apple to unlock it. They would not unlock it any other way. So that would require me to go out and buy like say a $40 SIM and sir and one month of service just to unlock what would have probably been valued at a $50 phone at that point in time. Well, it used That'd to be, be too. Um, they couldn't unlock the phone until it was six months old, didn't it? Oh yeah. I mean, this phone was like, it would have been on the service for like a year and a half. And then we switched to another company, and so then it was just a right. But that's that's something I just that remember was the original from law. Yeah. when when you and I were selling cell phones back in the day. Was we had to the phone had to be activated for six months before the service provider would provide the unlock code for it. Yeah, well, we had to on the wife's phone when we went to this trip. We had to pay off her phone before they would unlock her phone. Oh wow. Yeah, so I don't know what this is going to do to something like that, but it's and that's why stuff out there. You buy unlocked phones from the beginning and use prepaid services that don't lock you down, and you buy from companies like OnePlus that give you the freedom oh. to do whatever you want. I love my OnePlus. Oh yeah, we love you, OnePlus. Yes, somebody except so... for that one time when you put spyware in. Well, yeah, everybody makes mistakes. We remember. We remember, yeah. But, you know, I also remember the time that I dropped my OnePlus 5 in a bucket of water and it sat there for 15 minutes and it still works even though it's not waterproof. Good job, OnePlus. <laughs> this episode not brought to you by OnePlus. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so one of the interesting new freedoms that we get is we're able to now jailbreak um, voice assistant devices. So like your Amazon Echoes, yeah. Google Homes, you're now able to jailbreak them and do whatever you want with it, which I didn't realize you couldn't do before. Why is that important, Aaron? We should know exactly what's going on in the hardware that's connected to the internet and within our own homes. Yes, we should. Especially yes, those should. creepy some, things. Some people call me a zealot for being so hardcore about it, but if, if you can't look at the source code or if you can't pay somebody to look at the source code, it could be doing anything. And it's always on, connected to the internet. Who knows what it could be listening to. I still, to this day, do not have a Google Home or Alexa in my house. I'm, I don't either. I yeah. still have, I'm, I still wear my tinfoil hat. As Google and Amazon don't care because you have a smartphone sitting next to you. So yeah. you, they're, they've got all the data they need. That's a whole nother battle. Anyway, tinfoil hat show yeah. carrying on. In other news with Big Brother monitoring you, researchers have apparently found a way to identify the individual 3D printer that has created a 3D print. Now, yes. when we first saw this article, we were like, Psh, hogwash. Um, but the research paper that goes into it goes in depth. And... Um, hashtag deep. Hashtag deep, yeah. And... I read most of it, and my science-y white paper reading ability is pretty decent. It got deep, really deep. Um, and they're looking at far more things than the article that we're going to link to points at. Uh, the article mentioned um, just, like, the gaps and the layer thicknesses and the simple things. But what they're really looking at is the striations created by the nozzle, um, any sorts of things like ringing or any artifacting that are introduced by the motion system. Um, it, some really interesting points, but um, in, in that same light though, I think that, in my opinion, I, I think that this fingerprinting of 3D printers is a little uh, nonsensical 
purely because the whole reason 3D printers are so popular right now um, is because of the whole DIY world behind them. So if somebody really wanted to create a print to either be counterfeiting, which is what counterfeiting and creating um, illegal tracked things like um, firearms, uh, firearms uh, and keys uh, and things yeah. like criminal tools, we'll call them, um, is really like what keys. Yeah, it's really what this article was covering. Um, if you really wanted to create that stuff, you just go build yourself a kit printer and change a couple of subtle things on it. And, you know, there you go. Um, and I feel like a few of the things could be varied constantly. Um, if you were really trying to cover your tracks, I was thinking that could easily be a software option. Yeah. Anonymize my print. Like, and it would, it would vary temperature mid print and maybe, Add some random jitter. Yeah, very temperature, like really, very acceleration yeah. and jerk. And yeah, there's a whole bunch of software things that could be done. Uh, the only things that couldn't be changed in software are like the striations that the nozzle creates and you know, a couple other things. But nozzles are cheap. So if you're if if people are really trying to create this stuff for um, burner nozzle. Yeah, burner nozzles, quite literally. <laughs> if you're really trying to create this stuff for nefarious purposes, I'm not sure that uh, this research is uh, super valid. Very so if interesting. You look at, very interesting. Yes, it's very interesting. But if you, if you look at the printers they used, they're all Ultimakers. Um, they they um, have 14 different they printers. They're all, they're all commercially they're all the, available printers. Right. They're all the closed source ones, too, so you can't change things yeah, ultimakers technically buying, open source the, the the print these these type of printers though I, I don't think they're necessarily customized that often right by the people who buy these printers yeah um, so yeah. It, the, these these type of printers are more likely to be to stay stock yes when they're bought agreed and uh I, oh go ahead i also look at this article too as more of if you are like it's scare tactics is how I look at it too. You know, it's like, oh hey, we can fingerprint your printer and blah 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 and we can find you. I don't know. Finger... Did you look at the white paper? I did Eight. not look at the white paper. I've looked at the I've read the article, just like the high level article yeah. of this. So it's more about if they find like a printed bump key or something at the scene of a crime and they'll more they're more if the suspect then has like a row of printers or one or two printers at home, they would be able to narrow down which printer did it. It's yeah. not necessarily they find a print in the wild and like, oh, this was this printer within this batch. And here's a list of customers from Ultimaker that because because they even said they could narrow it down by batch, like from the machines made within a batch group, they could narrow it down to that, which is pretty neat. Yeah, but you know it, it's not that de detailed. They they specifically said it's only good for having access to the actual to some printers. They could they could reliably within like ninety four ninety six percent accuracy detect which printer that print came from if they had access to those printers. Yeah. yeah. Okay. the The high level article was just that it was very high level and it left a lot out. The uh, yeah. white paper was very well done. So if you yeah. guys are into to neat through additive research, um, it's it's worth reading, but not necessarily a super concern right now. Also, stop trying to use your 3D printer for illegal stuff. <laughs> You're making it hard for the rest of us. They're just having fun. All right. Okay. Do we have any makerspace news? We've gotten a lot of officer nominations this week. We did. Um, I'm seeing a lot of a, a lot of really decent people are stepping up to accept nominations for being voted for next month in officers. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm. Voting. I'm excited to see what's going to happen in the coming months. Yeah, uh, I we, was uh, rather surprised with some of the names that they're like, "Yeah, I'll accept a nomination." So, well, it looks like I have some competition for presidency. 
You need it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some healthy competition will make you do your job better. Yeah. I mean, or not. Not at all. <laughs> no, but we yeah, did have... I'm just glad people are um, that. We did have some pretty um, good, but like a good discussion happened this week on um, when children should be allowed in a maker space um, oh, yeah. and and uh, and how that supervision should happen and and all that, because our space specifically is very adult oriented. Um, all of our our tools are are very adult. We don't have like a child friendly area. Um, our clean area it could be considered pretty child friendly, but there's still a lot of places to trip and get hurt. And you know, our public night happens on a Thursday night. Uh, it starts around six thirty. So people are getting off of work and heading out to the space and kind of looking to blow off some steam and all that stuff. So, um, you know, the, the topic of a, like an adult swim time or uh, a child specific night uh, ha- has come up quite a few times now in recent months um, you know, because a number of our members have children and parents and we want to encourage parents to bring their kids to the space because you know sharing and creation and sharing that love is what the whole space was created for but at the same time we want to be respectful to our our members that are there to you know actually make stuff and to uh, have some time to be an adult um so it it's a it's a pretty heavy topic and uh it's generated a lot more discussion than i thought it would so I'm just excited that we're only what two months in to this new building. Not and even we're already face and we're already facing these challenges. Yes. Like that's awesome. Yeah. You know? Yeah. This, this is why we moved. Yeah. It's... Our, our old space was definitely not conducive to children. No. And I mean, I would say not even just children. I mean, there was probably a couple different demographics that we would did not appeal to in our old space. And the children brought a mother in with it. Not that I'm pointing out other demographics, but well, we don't just let kids in randomly. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yep. they need a they need a parent or guardian. <laughs> if they don't have a parent, we give them kittens and robots and lots of Red Bull. Well, we'll send, send them home. home with a goldfish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, a that, kid. Oh. <laughs> that, that's been kind of our running a makerspace discussion. And uh, some of the ideas that have come up have been, uh, you know, having a uh, kid specific day where uh, you know, all the parents can just bring their kids and we'll have focused activities. Because that's been the biggest thing is on Thursdays, when we have our public night, there is no organization. Everybody's just, you know, kind of there. It's a free for all. It's a very social night and it's hard to um, get any structure going in the space. Even when we have our member meetings, we have trouble even getting them started. So having kids <laughs> in the space is, is difficult because when kids don't have structure, they tend to explode. And uh, I say this as a parent of three, even when my kids don't have a structured activity, they drive me insane. And so when, yeah, we, we've got a bunch of kids in the space that don't have a structured activity. They just tend to go kind of crazy and shoulder surf everyone. So, um, yeah, we talked about having, like, structured hours for, like, kids that aren't allowed in the space after a certain time. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's Area. it's been a, it's been a difficult discussion because we don't want to be limiting um, right. but we also want to be respectful to all of our members. So, yep. Yeah. I say it's, it's a, it's a good, not to say like a, it's not a bad problem. It's a good problem to have considering it's a good challenge. Yes. Yeah. It's a challenge is a good word for it. Yeah. 
that's exactly why we moved. So I'm I'm just excited that we're already having to solve it. Yeah. Yeah. And we're seeing, I mean, just in general, we're seeing a lot of new activity that I feel like we had, not to say stagnated, but it. a lot of people I feel like were not pulling, we'd see fate new faces, but not people pulling the trigger. And we're finally seeing people, new people pulling the trigger. Hey, no, no, no gun talk, man. What are you doing? Well, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we have people that I, are joining the makerspace. There you go. Yeah, I have seen a lot of people in the space that I did not. I've never seen in the space before, even though they've been members for a long time, and that's awesome. Yep. Yeah. Yep. All right. Okay. So, so if you guys have, can, if you guys run spaces and have input on the whole children in the space thing, I I know it's a it's a bit of a topic. Even when I've brought it up in like the Nation of Makers chat or anything like that, it. it it becomes a very heated, polarized topic uh, because a lot of people feel like makerspaces should be very adult oriented because there's all kinds of focus towards kids other places and other people feel like the makerspace should be very kid oriented. And it's it's a discussion. Of, yeah, of, just like the saw stop. The saw stop should just be a saw. <laughs> that, it should just be in the space. We don't have one because we don't have five grand for a table saw. But um, the moment we do, our beast of a table saw is going to some member who can use it responsibly. And we're getting a saw stop so I can stop worrying about people removing fingers. Yeah. Also, if you guys have any ideas for good like segues, you know, (laughs) please let us know. And with that, we can go into our main topic, which is (laughs) which is, you know, why? Why and when do we decide to abandon projects and start new ones or just put off the current project and take on the new shiny project? But why do we have to put off the project? Why can't we just do seven projects at once, Aaron? Can you do seven projects at once, Joe? I mean, yes. I have seven projects, but doesn't mean I'm doing them all at once. I'm often known to do two or three at once. <laughs> I've, I've actually been starting trying to do more than one at once, but it's proving difficult. I'm, I'm much better at trying to focus all my free time on one thing and just making get, getting that done so I can move to something else. And this is a new thing. I In the past, I've always been the guy that will work on something until I get this awesome new idea. Then I just switch to that. And then I'm like, oh, when I get this done, I'll come back. I'm that guy. But then, you know, lo and behold, I'm halfway through this new project. I'm like, oh, I have this great idea for this other thing. And I jump to the next one. And so now you've got this trail of half-finished projects. Yeah. So here's, here's what you do. Move. Then you will really find out how many projects you had started and never completed. <laughs> I have done that once now in the last two years, and I am now getting ready to kind of like move in six months. And I'm just kind of like, all right, I'm going to clean this. I'm going to organize this. And I'm going, oh, man, I spent money on this and I probably shouldn't have because it hasn't gone past like an hour of work into it. And there's well, probably about 25 more hours of work to be done on it. <laughs> what, what was that? Uh, I don't know. I'm just making generalizations to what I know is out in my garage right now. <laughs> you don't know or you don't want to admit it. It's I fine, Josh. It. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm just thinking of the plastic shredder because I keep staring at it. It's on my, I want on it. my desk. I want it that so project, bad. That project has been blamed for like countless bags of plastic being dumped at the space not just oh at josh the space. on a plastic shredder not just at the space <laughs> i have a whole Ten... attic full of plastic <laughs> tens of pounds of hgp have been set aside for josh at my workplace oh. and he just never comes to get them <laughs> Yeah, but I need to make more. Uh, I need to make another machine to be able to handle though that that there that mass amount so of HDPE. There's a you know, in the same light. I almost 
almost have my wife convinced to let me buy the components for the other podcast that Aaron and I have been talking about. <gasps> what? <Yeah. laughs> I am. I, uh, I am so excited for that. Uh, me too. Me too. We're the because only I ones. Have a, I have a whole project now for that. We're the, to get it working. We're the only ones. Where people can. I know. But where, where people can tweet to a, a phone. And we answer it. I was I was telling her today about how excited I was because I was turning down projects that would pay me because of how stressed out I've been about how many projects I have going and how blah. and then in the same light I was like, oh by the way, I found that thing I need for really cheap. Um and it's close and I think I should go buy it. Then she's like, wait, 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 wait. Didn't you just say you weren't taking new things on? And I was like, but <laughs> I mean, it's not new because I've been trying to start this for three years. <laughs> if you guys don't remember, last week's episode was on taking on too many projects and getting burnt out. <laughs> Listen to that. <laughs> then come back to this and be like, Joe, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, uh, Let's see. I I mentioned before that I I'm I'm redesigning a motorized um uh bed for our, our small laser cutter, and that I had I had finalized the design. Well, uh, little did I know that design I don't like it anymore. You should finish after it. I after I didn't like the uh, the original design. So it's on, I'm on my third redesign now. Um. So with this one, Joe, it's using all extrusion. No, no aluminum plate because after putting my second design in the blazer, it was tiny because I didn't actually cut out the dimensions and do a test fit, and it's way too small for that laser cutter. Oops. Yeah. So learning as I go. Oops. Um, I almost, I, I almost laser cut that that dimensioned out. I was gonna do that. I'm like, ah, nah, it'll fit. <laughs> and well, yeah, it did fit, but like incredibly loosely. But Me- like tiny fit. Measure once. Cut six times. That's, yep, that's, that's how it goes. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah, so I spent all day today reworking that design. Um, so I stopped working on the photogrammetry scanner project um, because I decided that uh, I don't really have much need for it. Like, I don't literally need it. Um, I was talking with a local museum to scan some stuff, but they also haven't gotten back to me on whether they want to go f- forward with that. I still want to do it at some point because no one else has really done an open source photogrammetry scanner in the way that I want to do it. Um, but um, I'm also each time I'm taking on these projects, I'm putting off the access control system, which is one I really want to work on because that's going to be like a huge project, and it'd be like kind of like a defining project for me because it's you know circuit design, hardware design, software. Well, and it's uh, product design. It's one all, that all wrapped up in one. So many people can utilize if you do. Yeah, so it has a huge impact, and I, I, I'm, I feel bad. I keep putting it off, but I keep, I feel like you know, it's, it's one of those things where I'm more focused on getting the space up and working. Yeah. So I want to get that laser cutter working. So I want to get this thing done first, and then I'm slowly, you know, stopping other projects so that I, so once I'm done with all these, what I consider higher priority stuff. I can then start working solely on the access control system because I really want to get that done because I think it'll be awesome when it's done. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, like a lot of the access control, I mean, talking about the access control system, a lot of them that I've seen and I've found of like open source projects that are out there are very, like, they function, but they aren't like complete. Yeah. So seeing a complete project out there would be awesome. So if you can, if you could just do that yeah. and get that done, that would be great, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe by next Saturday. <laughs> you know, like, but the other thing is, though, um, getting it done and having it be well documented. So many open source projects don't ever finish the documentation, and there's a lot of expected knowledge to even start them. Um, I, I think if if we did this and we we did it with the intent of documenting it well so we could share it, that would make a huge difference. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. 
I say I am guilty of that myself with some of the projects that I've done of yeah. poor documents. Yeah. Like I complete the project, but poor documentation. I'm a I'm a software developer, man. I mean, that's like. Yeah, we don't we don't document. Well, yeah. we might write a comment or two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, read the comments in your code, man. <laughs> Thanks, jerks. So technically, code is documentation for what the computer's doing. What what middle managers are asking for is a human is for a, a, a middle school interpretation of what the human interpretation of the computer code is doing. The sad part it's is, interpretation of an interpretation. Look, the sad part is, is it, they'll it's never what get that people from like me. me that need to run your code, but aren't really good code authors need. And you guys are elitist jerks for not providing it. Awesome. I s- no, we're just, I we're just overworked and overburdened. We don't have time to write documentation because our project managers don't schedule time for documentation. Look, nope, if you proje- if you managed is- your project right, you would document as you went. All right. I agree. I agree, Joe. Hundred <laughs> yeah. percent. You should you should be a project manager. Yeah. And the first and the first thing when they ask you to shave time out of it, what do you shave out of it? Documentation. I shave for reliability. Because as soon as it doesn't work right, they give you more time. That is very true. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, so, yeah, in the past couple of months, I've been working on not taking on new t- new projects and also uh, reprioritizing or just completely taking off my list pro- of projects so I can start whittling down. I-, I would like to get to the point where I'm at no projects because I really need to work on my house. So, but... I put personal makerspace projects above house projects, and if I keep adding to the the, the maker projects, I'm never gonna work on my house. Yep, that's why my kitchen. So my house still is slowly falling apart. Floored. <laughs> that sounds that sounds um, pretty right, you know. Yep. Yeah, you're in a, you're in a different you're in a different place, Aaron. I say I've already been through that, and then you get then he, then you save it till the last minute. And then you're like, oh, crap, I'm selling my house and I need to get my house projects done. That's the thing. Yeah, we're, we're actually planning on maybe selling in a year or two, depending on when a family member puts their house up. So I don't want to be in that position where I have to rush and get everything wrapped up. I would like to have it mostly wrapped up, you know, so we can enlist it at any time. Right. Yeah. But house projects are just like your regular everyday projects. You'll get it like 90 percent there and you'll be like. I'll get the extra ten percent later. I'll, I'm, well, for I'm me, they're on... also not as fun. Yeah, that's yep. true. I don't want to. Re- I don't want to re- redo my staircase. That's not fun. That's just cutting treads and staining them. Eh, it's not too bad. So usually, my my hierarchy of taking on projects are, um, and, and this isn't right, but this is how it goes. Who is it for? Are they paying me in some form or fashion, whether it's barter or uh, money or whatever? And then um, am I even remotely interested in doing the project? And right now, I better be damn excited about that project. Otherwise, it's, I'm not taking it on. And, uh, and then lastly, is the project for me? And if the project's for me, it's probably going to get put on the back burner because... The first four always seem to take precedent, and that's driving me insane, which led to last week's episode. So um, I do have a couple projects hopefully coming up that I'm really excited about that are 100% for me, and everyone else can just go away and leave me alone. And uh, (laughs) if they come to light, you guys will hear all about them. But um, I'm really looking forward to those potential projects. And I'm also very much looking forward to um, projects that I can do at the makerspace when I'm not an officer and feel obligated to do them. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So. I look forward to not having to pay attention to officers chat. Yeah, that's, that's a, that's the thing. But yep. Usually like, the other thing we talk we're talking about is when we stop doing projects. And typically when I stop doing projects is 
when a new shiny project comes along mm-hmm. or, and this is my worst case. This is like the worst thing about me as a maker. I stop working on the project when the project is functional. And Josh gives me crap about this all the time. It, he calls it Joe Dunn. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's oh, I know. It's not aesthetic. We had to we had to disassemble some Joe projects to move some of the equipment. No, you didn't. <laughs> Those weren't me. Um, <laughs> the uh, been less work to undo. <laughs> it would have been less work to undo had it been me, because it probably wouldn't have been screws in it. My projects usually the wiring isn't clean. Um, rarely are they painted and polished, but always do they function and work really well because I usually get it to that point and then figure I'm going to modify it later. So what's the point in taking it to the pretty phase? And you know what? 95% of the time I'm right. I, I, I'm glad that I never finished the wiring on my I4 because do you know how many times I've changed the controller card and the hot end out on it. Cause I don't, it's been a lot and you know, all finishing does is make that harder. So <laughs> in the other sense, like I take things too far into a prettifying them. Well, I'll say, but when I've had a problem, you are right there to say, this is why I don't, <laughs> This is why I get it Joe done and don't get it Josh done. Because <laughs> when you get it Josh done, you got to spend like an hour undoing all the nice, pretty things that you did just to get down to what you need to fix. Yep. AKA on my 3D printers. It's countless times. <laughs> well, you know, yeah. one of these times I'm going to get Josh done and it's going to be gorgeous and I'm going to love it. But you know, until that time happens, it's just going to keep getting Joe done. It's going to keep being functional and it's going to keep annoying me that I have to scotch bright the nozzle every time because I didn't spend an hour to like put the nozzle wipe in or something weird like that. It's awful specific. <laughs> <laughs> so we just hit the uh, 45 minute mark. Um, do you guys have any final thoughts you'd like to leave with our listeners this week? Um, I'd say the biggest thing is don't always feel like you have to finish. If the project's not making you happy anymore, stop. Exactly. Yeah. I say, I, I mean, like I've, I have actually picked up some of my projects that I've put behind or things that I've just put on the back burner because other things have been more important as of late. And you know, sometimes too, it's not always abandoning a project. It's putting it aside because either funds or it requires too much time or other things take higher priority at the time. And you will sometimes come back to those. I mean, I have countless projects in the last year that I have ultimately finished that I could have easily abandoned. Oh, yeah. AKA my Franken presser, which is my air compressor that I built out of two old air compressors to make one giant air compressor. You know, that's one. I mean, I use my 3D printer as an an example because I had parts that I needed to get replaced on it due to a warranty issue. And, you know, I got it done finally. You know, it only took me three months to get that done, but I got it done. Yeah. And, you know. Yep. And new projects come up all the time. Especially when you're us yeah. or people like us. I mean, people I'm building a house right now. Bringing things to you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Say, I'm building a house right now. And instead of being like a normal person and just letting the builder do everything, I'm like, oh, I'll do that and I'll do that and I'll do that. And actually, like, I've, I feel like I've been pretty good about the, the I'll do that type of scenario (laughs) because there was things even that I've done. I'll do that. And then I sit there and my wife's looking at me going, why don't you just let him do it? I'm like, you know what? I was just thinking that (laughs) because she's like, you have plenty of things that you want to do that 
you don't need this hanging over your head. So, and then finding out that my builder wants to use my house as a display piece means that I have to get certain things done. So, things that I wanted to do or thought about doing, I'm not doing. So, <laughs> but that's okay. Yeah. But I've turned one of the projects into kind of like a makerspace project. So, oh, that's, that's good. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited about that too. Yeah. So, just for anybody that is curious listening to the podcast we will be live streaming uh from river city labs um our facebook live page we will be um facebook living um concrete countertop pour next our tuesday so in two days so i don't know if uh, this will be posted by then or not but keep um, no even if it won't uh, look on the fa- <laughs> look on the Facebook page. We'll post pictures, and I'll actually post the video out there too of it. So, and then I'm actually working on a how to video, which is just another one of my projects. Yeah. Hey Josh, why so, don't you go yeah. ahead and post the links to that in our Makers on Tap subreddit, r slash Makers yeah. on Tap, and then we can also that's post why it's it there on our Instagram page and our Facebook page. You know what, Joe? I will do that. Nice. (laughs) Excellent. (laughs) I'm with Joe, though. Uh, Do what makes you happy. If you're working on something and it's no longer bringing you joy, just stop it. Unless if it's a personal project, you know, there's nothing keeping you from finishing it. So and there's nothing wrong with turning down paid projects. Starts to feel good. (laughs) Yeah. I've started to do that in the last two years and it is a wonderful thing because I can do my own projects and I can do projects that with my kids that normally that would be sadly, that would be one of the things that potentially gets thrown to the wayside when paid projects come up. Yep. All right. Well, if there's anything you guys would like to, uh, you guys and the listeners. If there's anything that the listeners would like to hear us talk about, feel free to reach out to us on any of our social media pages. We're on Instagram and Reddit and Facebook. And uh, I don't know. I don't know if you have a Twitter or not. But nope, not reach yet. out to us. However, reach out to us any way that you feel you want to. Let us know what you want to hear, what you want us to talk about. Um, if you have any ideas for news topics or anything else, just you know, feel free to let us know. Um, if you think we suck, please tell us. Uh, tell us how we're sucking, and we'd like to improve it. All right. So with that, yeah, with that, you know, keep making stuff. Thanks, guys. Yep, thank you.